Hello, everyone, and welcome to Simon's Book Club, where we'll talk about the best books in psychology, neuroscience, consciousness, well-being, mindfulness, and dig into great ideas that could help us all heal. And we definitely all need to heal. Yes, we do. Now, I'm very pumped about this episode. I've waited five episodes to get here to be able to talk about these ideas that mean a lot to me. But before I get overly excited, here's a quick recap to get you all up to speed. To connect with each other, we need to stop judging each other, to stop criticizing people, and instead to talk about what's alive inside of us and how we feel and what we need. Now, to understand how we feel, we need to take better care of our bodies, which deeply impact how we feel. One problem that arises is that words get in the way of describing how we feel because we've all been taught these emotional concepts differently. There are no standard definitions of the emotions that we feel. There's no such thing as universal emotion. There's no common experience of them. Emotions are highly subjective and not objective at all. So this seems like an insurmountable problem until burr, 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 the circumplex. All hail the circumplex. Let me explain this magical tool to you. All that you need to know about the circumplex is that it has an X, Y axis. And on the X axis, you can rate your feelings as negative or positive. And on the Y axis, you talk about how agitated or aroused you are. And by aroused, in this case, I don't mean horny. I'm talking about how much do you feel this emotion? How much energy is here? Though you can plot out your horniness on the circumplex as well. Are you high arousal horny or are you low arousal horny? But I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. With these two axes, you can map out what emotion you're feeling in clearly understandable language. So let me give you some examples here. Based on what my emotional experiences are like, I can feel low arousal, positive valence, like when I'm feeling nice and calm or relaxing on the beach in the sun or after a nice nap or after finishing a meditation session. I can feel medium arousal, positive valence, like when I'm out with friends and having a good time or if I'm taking my dog for a walk on a beautiful day or when I'm sitting at the park and I'm feeling very inspired in my writing. Or I could feel high arousal, positive valence, like if I just scored the game-winning shot in a basketball tournament or if I hit my personal record for weightlifting or like when I hear that my friend tells me that she finally got pregnant after trying for so long. It's I arousal there. We can also plot out our negative experiences. I could feel low arousal, negative valence, like when I'm feeling sick in bed or if it's raining and I'm stuck indoors or when I'm feeling depressed. I could feel medium arousal, negative valence, like when I'm trying to talk to someone and they don't know how to hold space and just keep on bringing the conversation back to themselves. Or like when I'm trying to build something I brought from Ikea and to follow its godforsaken instruction manuals. I think you know how that feels. Or I could feel high arousal, negative valence, like when I'm being yelled at or like when I'm having an anxiety attack. That's it. You now know the circumplex. All hail the circumplex. Positive and negative valence mixed with levels of arousal. Now, the scale itself is called the circumplex and what you get from plotting your experiences on it is something also known as affect. And affect is something that we all have. Affect is universal in humans and arguably in animals as well. Emotions themselves can't be universally understood, but affect, as far as I've read, seems to be universal. Emotions are specific and affect is general. And so the glorious circumplex is a tool that we can use to better understand what we're feeling and to clearly express it to others. If you wanna communicate with someone and you're having a hard time understanding their experience and connecting with what's alive in them, whip out the circumplex and play emotional twister with it. You can place any of your emotional concepts on there. Rage, it's high arousal negative. Blissful, medium, low arousal positive. What's cool here is that you and someone else can have very different sensations and very different affects for the emotions that you use the same word for. Like, for example, where would you put your experience of hangry on the chart? Is that high arousal or low? I get low energy when I know some people that get very activated when they're hungry. Where would you put your experience of horny on the chart. Depending on what kind of religious tradition you grow up in, horniness might be plotted as either positive or negative. It's true. I recently did this with a friend. I talked about the circumplex, I mean, not 
horniness. Uh, she was telling me that she was feeling melancholy and I was trying to understand what that experience was like. She described it with a few examples and she kind of talked about it as like a pensive sadness. And I tried to see if I understood her by describing situations that I was in that seemed similar. Did that a line? Well, no, she told me there was a detail that I was missing and I didn't really quite get it. I tried guessing some more and I was completely off still. And then I just whipped out the circumplex. All hail the circumplex. And I asked her to point on the chart where she felt it. For her, melancholy was a low arousal state that wavered back and forth in valence, sometimes negative, but with elements of positive valence too. And that's very cool. I didn't know that melancholy could be positive as well, but I could understand her so much more. And I felt that I could connect with what she was saying then to connect with the feeling that was alive in her because I can have the same feeling. I've used this on the Discord as well when people would describe their experiences and I'd have difficulty in understanding them. So so here, here, to those of you with low emotional intelligence, if you've been told by your partners that you are emotionless, or if you are Spock-like, or robotic, or if you are experiencing any degree of alexithemia and you're having difficulty connecting with what someone else is experiencing, the circumplex is your friend. It's a good tool. Use it well. As someone who truly has difficulty in understanding what other people are feeling, I'm sometimes amazed that other people can understand what others are feeling. Like, how? What? Do you actually know what someone's feeling when they're describing their experience? Or are you just assuming that you do based on your projection of what you think is a similar situation that you've experienced? Or do you just not really fuss too much about connecting with their emotions and kind of gloss over that part of the talk with them? I really want to know what's alive in you. And because I know that my emotional landscape is rather bizarre, since all I really want to do is cultivate this relentless spirit of feeling loving towards all creatures, and I'm actively pursuing that goal, I know most people don't feel the same way, unfortunately. I don't actually know anyone else with that set of values, really. And so I know that my experience is different from theirs. But that doesn't mean that I don't want to connect. I do. I want to connect and I want to understand others. And so the circumplex has been invaluable for me. I think this is also why happiness is so hard for people to agree on. According to Lisa Feldman Barrett, Younger American adults tend to prefer the upper right quadrant, pleasant high arousal. Middle-aged and older Americans tend to prefer the lower right quadrant, pleasant low arousal, as do people from Eastern cultures like China and Japan. For some, happiness is a sustained positive low arousal calmness, while for others, happiness is experienced in moments of high arousal, like the happiness we feel when we get a promotion. Or if you grew up in Canada, you might remember this commercial, happiness is yelling bingo. It was an advertisement for gambling. So I know that my preferences have changed for sure. I used to be interested just in peak experiences of high arousal and I lived many years experience hunting like this. And now I kind of find that unsustainable and exhausting. It could be because I'm 40 now. It's definitely because I'm 40 now. I think many people are discontent because they equate happiness with high arousal, positive valence, and they're uncomfortable with tapping into the pleasantness of low arousal well-being, which is why we have so many books talking about happiness, where the message in many of them is to settle for sustained well-being. And that's probably because many of the people writing these books are older and are more tapped into the benefits of calm. Young people make music about high arousal, excited states. And then you get old and you write books. The message is often that high arousal positive affect is unsustainable. It's the hedonic treadmill and we get accustomed to the highs. Lifestyle creep kicks in and then we get dissatisfied with life when we can't keep feeling those high arousal states. It's chasing the dragon for those of you that know that term. Or it's the realm of hungry ghosts for people interested in Buddhism. Yes, I finally found a way to inject some woo into this talk as well. The point is, we can't win the lottery every day, and we're setting our standards for happiness too high. Another cool thing about the circumplex, I think, is that it frees us from our thoughts and judgments, which are the root of so much of our suffering, and plants our emotions into a sense of embodiment. I've heard the phrase of moving from the head to the heart, especially in the mindfulness circles that I move in, and I think that this might resonate with some of you. The circumplex 
is the language for the alexithymic. You can still experience bodily sensations in different situations, but you won't lump these different situations together under an emotional category, like angry or sad or stressed. You'll just view each situation as a new one with a fresh set of eyes, with a beginner's mind. And just like be in the present and stop trying to label what this is. Side note, it's not just emotions that are constructed, but relationships too. But relationship anarchy is a topic that I'll cover in another video. We'll get there one day. Now back to the circumplex. All hail the circumplex. This doesn't mean that we avoid using emotional words altogether. I think the circumplex is an added layer that we could use in really understanding our emotions so that we could frame our experience in a more relatable and understandable way, in a way that we could process and pay more attention to the sensations in us rather than talking about others and what they're doing right or wrong, which really ties into this message that I'm so obsessed with in nonviolent communication. Emotions reflect inwards, not outwards. Emotions are our own shit and not someone else's responsibility. Now I've just been exposed to a concept that relates to the circumplex, something you might have known before I caught wind of it, as some of my friends told me about the emotional wheel, which would really be useful in understanding the connections between emotions. It offers a lot of emotional granularity, which also kind of maps onto the circumplex, where we see what emotions arise when our needs are being met, versus what emotions arise when our needs aren't being met. This too, you might remember from the nonviolent communication process. Boy, it all down and our emotions are just a response to our needs being met or not. That's it. Clean and simple. Bringing back to the circumplex, when our needs are being met, we experience positive valence, while when our needs aren't being met, we feel negative valence. And with that, I would like to nominate myself for the No <laughs> Sherlock Award. Thank you, Captain Obvious. I'm glad you got that lesson. Now I'm also going to take a step back here for a bit and look at this from a very different angle, as underneath all of these points, both mine and Lisa Feldman Barrett's, is the assumption of what it means to master your emotions, which I think is a violent idea, as mastery suggests a domination, a control, an ownership, and violence to me means the use of power to control and coerce. Nonviolence suggests acceptance of things as they are, unconditionally and welcomingly. Welcome, welcomely? A common phrase in compassion meditation, also known as metta, is may you love and accept yourself just as you are. Part of the mastery of emotions, I think, is our letting go of the idea of mastering them. They'll come and arise whenever they will, and the more we fight against them when they show up, the more we give them power. And that's a message we get through Tara Brock's reign process, through the opening up and letting go process in Buddhism, through the pivoting process in acceptance commitment therapy that's growing in popularity amongst psychologists, and also through a key message that you learn from a psychedelic experience. Whatever you resist persists. Welcome it all with kindness and awareness and let it go. So let's get back to this idea of mastering our emotions and let me change the question a bit. I think the idea is that if we're not the master of our emotions, then they'll be the master of us. And our emotions will have us acting and thinking in ways that we don't want to experience. And so the reasoning goes, the only way out of this trap is to become the master ourselves which reminds me of a quote by Paulo Freire. I've never said his name out loud. When education is not liberating, the dream of the oppressed is to become the oppressor. Ain't that the truth? Maybe the idea here isn't to wrestle for the power between controlling and being controlled by our emotions, to not buy into either extreme, but to change our relationship with our emotions altogether so that we could cooperate with them instead in which we could experience them and acknowledge them and listen to what they're saying to us and then at the end of it all we can still be free to choose the actions that align with our values i think this is a good place to end the video even though i wrote thousands of more words on this idea and i could write thousands more i'm really excited for this the next two videos in this series are going to be a talk with the author i'm very f stoked about this. I think I've taken liberties with her ideas here and I'm sure I could use some recalibration as well. I'm very interested in the circumplex. All hail the circumplex! And the universality of affect and alexithemia and in better understanding some of the science behind her conclusions. The reason I read these books is to be able to better connect with others. And one of the questions I have about emotions is, well, 
don't they kind of get in the way of us connecting with others? In nonviolent communication, we can't compassionately connect with someone if we are in need of empathy ourselves, if we have some unmet needs that are demanding our attention, and if we have something alive in us that's distracting us from our connection. If all of our needs are being met, would we still feel any challenging emotions, still feel anything on the circumplex? I'll talk about all these ideas and more with the author directly. Stay tuned. It's going to be great.